caught between Westminster and Brussels. The UK leader has the backing of MPs to renegotiate her Brexit deal. But the EU says there's nothing to negotiate. So what is Theresa May's next move? It could Britain crash out of the EU with no deal. This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Rochelle Carey. In less than two months, the UK will leave the European Union. What's less certain now is how that is going to happen. British MPs have given Theresa May the go-ahead to renegotiate parts of her Brexit agreement, but they've rejected the possibility of leaving the EU without any deal in place. Meanwhile, the EU is opposing any reopening of the current agreement, which was signed in November after 18 months of negotiations between the UK and EU leaders. They agreed on the terms of the UK's departure from the 28-member bloc, but British MPs rejected it earlier this month, which forced May to come up with the Plan B, but they special focus on the controversial issue of the Irish border. Here's what Theresa May had to say after Parliament voted on Tuesday. The vote was decisive, and I listened. So the world knows what this House does not want. Today, we need to send an emphatic message about what we do want. It is now clear that there is a route that can secure a substantial and sustainable... ..substantial and sustainable majority in this House for leaving the EU with a deal. We will now take this mandate forward and seek to obtain legally binding changes to withdrawal agreement. Opposition Labour Party leader Jeremy Corbyn says he's willing to meet the Prime Minister to discuss the next steps. Since we've had this debate and the House has emphatically voted to reject the no deal option that the Prime Minister was uh, supporting, could I say that we are prepared to meet her to put forward to put forward the points of view from the Labour Party? of the kind of agreement we want with the European Union to protect jobs, to protect living standards and to protect rights and conditions in this country. France's President Emmanuel Macron has stressed the EU's stance that Theresa May's Brexit deal is not up for discussion. As the European Council has clearly indicated, this withdrawal agreement negotiated between the European Union and the UK is the best deal possible and it is not renegotiable. Let's bring in our guests now in London, Catherine McBride, senior economist in the International Trade and Competition Unit at the Institute of Economic Affairs. In Brussels, Peter Klepp, head of the Brussels office for the think tank Open Europe. And also in London, Jonathan List, deputy director for British Influence, a pro-EU think tank, and was also a former senior assistant to Charles Tannock, a member of the European Parliament. Thank you all for joining us. We appreciate it. Um, Jonathan, I'll put the first question to you. The EU has been very, very clear that we do not want to renegotiate. What are British MPs thinking, telling Theresa May to go back? Um, well, they are out of ideas. Um, Theresa May had the option to uh, reach out to uh, the opposition, to Labour MPs, maybe to uh, try and renegotiate the political declaration to have a customs union, for example. But instead, um, she has tacked to the right and endorsed an amendment um, which tries to do the impossible. It tries to renegotiate the backstop, which the EU has insisted cannot be amended. Now, Parliament... Uh, is stuck. Um, they want to remove the backstop. It's the only way they can get the deal through, but they do not control this process. A negotiation takes two parties and they simply don't have the power to force it. It's like giving May a mandate to colonise Mars. It means nothing and it makes everyone involved look absurd. And what about passing these, these non-binding amendments? Does, does that concern you even constitutionally speaking? Does that concern you? Not, not really, because if something is, is non-binding, then, then obviously uh, that's, uh, that doesn't sort of affect the Constitution. The only problem would be is if uh, the Parliament changed the law to uh, cancel the backstop and that wasn't approved by the EU, because then the, the Britain would be in breach of its international obligations and that would precipitate a no-deal crash-out, which would be an economic and social catastrophe. 
Um, Peter, as I said, um, and as the EU as, as a whole and as certain leaders in Europe, Angela Merkel, Emmanuel Macron, they have said over and over and over again that th this is it. You need to make this work. Do, does the EU mean that? Do you think they could be nudged? Well, of course, uh, it's not because the European Union says something that they will stick to it. I mean, there's many <laughs> examples where politicians or EU officials change their opinion and that seems to be lost uh, in the debate. I mean, uh, the British politicians uh, do the same thing, of course. Um, the Guardian reported uh, yesterday that behind the scenes some diplomats have been looking at ways to uh, limit the backstop, uh, to provide an exit mechanism um, f out of it uh, for the UK. And even if you look into the text of the withdrawal agreement, there are already ways for the United Kingdom to unilaterally uh, abandon its obligations, um, but only in case the EU acts in uh, bad faith. Um, there are obligations for the EU to, to, to do their best uh, to get to a trade deal. Now you may ask yourself, what does that even mean legally? Uh, but uh, one way out of this uh, would be to sort of clarify um, the right that the UK has uh, under this um, to abandon the backstop. Also, if you really care uh, to have a sustainable deal, I think it's a responsible um, thing to try to make sure that uh, Britain will not forever be stuck under the customs regime of the European Union. I don't think anyone uh, can imagine that the, the world's fifth biggest economy would forever follow uh, the EU's uh, trade regime. And as hard as it may be to reconcile that, not only with avoiding uh, border checks in Northern Ireland, but also uh, with protecting the supply chains of companies between mainland Europe and Britain, uh, a way has to, will have to be found oh, to oh. enable the UK to one day recover trade powers. Um, Catherine, I will get to you in a moment, but I, I want to go back to Jonathan just because I could tell by the way he was um, shaking his head, you perhaps wanted to respond to what Peter was saying. Thanks. The, the point here is that um, if you have um, differential tariffs between Northern Ireland, which is in the UK, and Ireland, then you will have to have a hard border. No one has come up with any um, agreeable way of resolving that conundrum. And for that reason, the backstop will be permanent in the sense that we will always be in the same customs territory as the EU. That is a product of the impossible red lines that the government has put up. So it is simply fantasy to say that we can uh, unilaterally withdraw from the backstop or alternative arrangements can be found because peace in Northern Ireland is the overriding priority of all the parties. It's more important than the right of the UK to have its own uh, tariff raising powers. When we talk, obviously there's so much attention being focused on, on, on the backstop, understandably, but Catherine, how does it strike you that there wasn't more discussion about the border in all of the Brexit negotiations, and what well, take that back, Brexit campaigning rather, up to the vote. This is such a big deal now. Do you think there was enough discussion about it before we even got this far? Well, I think that the people involved probably didn't discuss it enough because unlike what Jonathan has just said, right now there are different VAT and different excise rules on either side of the Irish border, and they seem to be able to cope with that quite well. And most of those payments are done electronically and most of the people that are taking trade across the border are doing it on a regular basis. And so it is in fact quite easy for the authorities to catch up with people and make sure that they have paid the excise duty, for instance, on petrol, fuel, diesel, uh, which are quite different on either sides of the border. So I don't think that you need a hard border to do that. Um, and I do believe that there, if, you know, Amazon can tell me where my parcel is at any one time, I think that we will have the um, ability to check the border. I don't think that that is insurmountable. But I also think that the, the whole referendum campaign was not so much about practicalities, it was about the, the bigger picture of where the UK wants to be. And I think Europe is becoming more and more a single entity 
And I think, in a way, that's very good for continental Europe to do that, the especially whole, the Eurozone. I just want to touch on the, something you, you and, just said. Um, the, the UK was always going to be opposed to that, so it was time that the UK left. But how, how could you have such a, a vote of such consequence and not have discussed and really dealt with some of the practicalities? Well, the, pe the, the people running the Vote Leave campaign were not the government, so they weren't actually in a position to do so. But there is, well, there have been quite a few publications written independently going through all of the ways you could do this. But they are not, even now, they're, they're written by professors or they're written by um, interested parties. A couple of MEPs have written interesting books. And um, so they are still not the government. Um, so that they're not in a position to make those things happen. But there are MPs um, who, who supported it, Brexit who were in a position to push oh, for yes. some real digging and some real information and a, and a broader discussion to make voters more informed? Well, that's, that's happening now, but that wasn't happening in the campaign. Sorry, your ori original question was about the campaign. I think now um, we have had the problem where quite a lot of Brexit-supporting ministers who were in positions of power in the Cabinet have had to resign because they disagreed with the way the government was handling things. Unfortunately, a lot of other people in the Cabinet who disagree with the way the government is handling things, but from a, a Remain in Europe perspective, <laughs> right. they don't seem to feel any obligation to resign unless they're doing it um, as one of, the, um, one of the business ministers has recently threatened to resign in two weeks if um, he doesn't get his own way. And uh, quite frankly, I think it's time that the Prime Minister stood up to these guys and said, OK, the door is there, off you go now. OK, Why wait for two weeks. All right, let me... Um, <laughs> hold on just know, a sec. She's let got me, to start saying that. Let me bring Jonathan in, because, yes, there has been a lot of talk about Theresa May and is she the person to make this happen. Um, do you think these problems would still exist even if it weren't Theresa May? I think we have uh, a double whammy because Britain itself finds itself uh, in an extremely weak position and it's led by an extremely weak Prime Minister. Uh, Theresa May has compounded our woes by insisting on impossible red lines, those being leaving the single market, leaving the customs union, but also having no uh, border between Great Britain and Northern Ireland and, of course, having no hard border on the island of Ireland. Now, it's simply a fact that if you leave... Uh, a tariff regime, and if you leave the single market, there will be different regulations on two sides of the border and different tariff regimes. Those have to be enforced with physical infrastructure as they are everywhere in the world. Now, to come back to an original point. The backstop is partly legal, but more importantly, perhaps, is political. So we can argue about the economics and the, and the legal practicalities, but fundamentally, this is about where the EU's priorities lie. Ireland is uh, a member state of the European Union. Britain, although bigger, is leaving the European Union. So the UK, for the first time in its history, finds itself less powerful than Ireland and can't quite understand it. But the EU will always have solidarity with Ireland over the UK, and that is why the backstop will never be amended. So, uh, Peter, what of that? Who, who has the leverage here? It certainly doesn't seem like the UK does. Well, um, there's another country uh, that um, is not in the EU uh, that has possibly even more trade uh, with uh, the EU than Britain does, uh, that is not in the uh, EU single market and that is also outside of the EU's uh, customs union, and that is Switzerland. Uh, the head of the Swiss Customs has been speaking to the Northern Ireland Committee in Westminster and he has said that it should be possible to have an invisible border in Northern Ireland. Now, I don't want to dismiss the, um, the hurdles to achieve that. Uh, actually, there has been some discussions uh, on that particular point between the EU and the UK already, whereby the United Kingdom has proposed to exempt uh, small businesses from customs checks, which the EU has refused. So I think um, the solution will have to uh, lie into uh, flexibility. And uh, we need some flexibility. We need some acceptance that there may be a little uh, customs hole in Northern Ireland. And uh, I don't think that is so unreasonable. 
Uh, why? Because uh, there are already two uh, giant uh, customs holes into uh, the EU's sacred customs border, and those are the ports of Antwerp and Rotterdam, uh, where many goods are entering Europe and only a tiny fraction is being checked. And um, uh, politicians in my own country, Belgium, uh, from Antwerp have been uh, saying that uh, there are many problems with that. So it would be completely irrational not to allow a little bit of flexibility uh, at the very unimportant uh, part of the EU's customs border in Northern Ireland. Catherine, is a no-deal Brexit still a possibility? Do you think that could happen? I, I think it's very definitely still a possibility. I was delighted to see that the two amendments that were most likely to stop it um, were both rejected last night. I don't believe you can go into any kind of negotiation and not have the ability to walk away at the end. Um, and I think that it is with that in mind that the, there, you were talking at the beginning about the EU opening up the negotiations again. And I think one of the reasons they could consider doing that is because if they don't, the obvious solution is we walk away and that does hurt them. Though, of course, it doesn't hurt them uniformly. I would take an issue with Jonathan saying that the, if we leave, we'll have different regulations on either side of the border. Right now, we have the same. And I don't see any massive rush to deregulate on either side of that border right now. I think people are panicking about something that doesn't exist. Again, with our trade with Europe, we predominantly trade with nine European countries. In fact, we do 90% of our trade with nine European countries. So those countries will be very determined that we should do some kind of deal if we are living on WTO terms. Where, of course, the other 18 countries in Europe who all get a vote, they probably couldn't care less. So that is the problem with Europe, is it, people like to look at it as a homogenous group, but it's not. Um, a few countries will be very severely affected, and one of them is Ireland. Now, with the Irish question, there has always been a special rules between the UK and Ireland. It has always been treated differently from the rest of the EU. We have always had, for instance, a common travel area with Ireland, which we don't have. We're not in Schengen, and we don't have any common travel area with the rest of the EU countries, but we do with Ireland. So if we've been able to manage that sort of area, which is slightly different from the rest. I think that we can definitely have some arrangement that works for the border. Um, and I do definitely think that, that um, no deal is, is an option. It has to be an option. Jonathan, I, I can tell that you don't agree. What do you see as... Um, some of the most severe consequences of a no Brexit deal. Some of them obviously are, are unknown because this has not happened before. But what do you see as the known potential consequences of a no Brexit deal? Well, obviously, when you um, walk away from 45 years of, of economic integration, uh, you know what you're going to lose. So uh, Catherine can talk about having a, a deal, even though we have no deal. Um, but of course, uh, it's about recognition of those standards. So if there's no deal underpinning our relationship with the EU, then France and Belgium will be required to check goods for taxes and standards so they currently do not check. That is a, a, a legal consequence of leaving without a deal. And for that reason, because we import so much of our food, for example, and our medicines through the channel ports, and that will lead to massive congestion, just as, as the most visible uh, consequence. So uh, the, the, you know, the people who run those ports, um, the food sector, the, the retail sectors are, are, are tearing their hair out about the, the possibility that they won't be able to get goods in the supermarkets, medicines in the hospitals, and that businesses will be shattered by the uh, death of supply chains. Now, just to come back to, just pre briefly, to the point that Peter made about Switzerland, of course, Switzerland is not in the single market or the customs union. It has many bilateral agreements with the single market that the UK would not be able to replicate because the EU doesn't like them. But the fundamental point is that when you go to Switzerland, there are physical borders with the EU. You have to go through a customs post every time you go between Switzerland and France, for example. So the idea that Switzerland is some kind of example for us to follow is nonsense. Peter, did you want to reply? Well, yeah, I mean, we always come back to the same argument. Eh? Uh, the argument is the EU doesn't like it, sure. Uh, but the EU uh, will like uh, zero access uh, 
for UK goods uh, and uh, services even less because that would disrupt trade even more. So uh, checkers or uh, the Swiss uh, model or uh, pick and choose, uh, pay to play is the only model uh, that can safeguard uh, a degree of British sovereignty and uh, intense trade between uh, the UK and mainland Europe and that's why this model will be chosen and I very much agree that a no deal would be chaotic, uh, it's absolutely um, a bad idea. Um, a lot of the trade between uh, Britain and, and the EU27 would become illegal. Uh, there's not even um, uh, a deal uh, to, to, um, to prevent chaos in aviation at the moment. A, a number of things have been uh, catered for. But um, in theory, no flights between the UK and mainland Europe are possible anymore. Uh, many of the flights inside of Spain may even uh, be illegal because they are, um, they are done by a company that could be considered on, under some interpretation as a non-EU, as a British um, company. So, uh, of okay. course, that could perfectly be sorted, sure, but it sure. can't be sorted in such a short period of time. Um, Catherine, I can tell that you, you seem to, to think... Uh, no, I don't, hold on just a second. It seems that you think that yeah, some of the things, I, I some of the to... flags that Jonathan and Peter are raising, you seem to think are, I don't know, overblown. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but, but go ahead. Com completely overblown. Um, in, back to the basic mac microeconomics, the customer is always right. Jonathan seems to have forgotten when he's talking about food coming in from Europe that we're the customer and we will be the ones who apply tariffs should we want to apply them and we will be the ones checking that the food coming in is what we want that re meets our standards. So it would be unlikely that we would slow things down at the border. They are coming to us. <laughs> we want to buy them. Same with the pharmaceutical industry. In terms of the aviation industry, Eurostat has some wonderful figures on this. One third of all intra-EU passengers on planes come from the UK. So they may not be UK passport holders, but they start their journey in the UK, um, whether they're flying to Cyprus for a holiday or going back to Poland or Latvia or whether they live in Spain these days. One third of your customers. Now, there is not one airline in the EU who will survive that. If they lose one third of their customer base, they lose everything. You know, they're out of business. Alitalia is out of business now. You know, they, they are all running at very, very low profit, profitability. If the airline industry wants to be decimated, then the EU should block flights going to the UK. Very okay. clever. Okay. Or not so clever. All right. Um, um, and I, the same with the food. I mean, why mm -hmm. would we stop importing food? Why would we block our own food? All right. I mean, okay. It, it, they're is... completely twisting this. Okay. We're about out of time. Um, I'm going to put the last question to you, Jonathan, uh, pretty quickly. Bottom line, do you think there will be a second referendum? Um, I think that it's uh, the likeliest of a series of unlikely options because uh, there, there may be nothing else uh, to do um, but put it back to the people if Parliament is deadlocked. And just to, on the point, just to, I have to address this point that Catherine made very quickly about food coming in. The question is not that we would check the goods coming in, although we would be required to. It's that the French and Belgians will do so and because we're depending on roll-on, roll-off traffic, it doesn't matter if we're not checking the goods, they will be and that's what's going to cause congestion. And that is another the reason why a second referendum will be likely because if we do look like we're going into a no-deal scenario which will be such a, an economic car crash it could be the only way to save us. All right I, I have a feeling we'll be continuing to discuss uh, Brexit for quite some time to come. Thank you all I'm sure we will have you back again appreciate it very much. Thank you Catherine McBride, Peter Clef and Jonathan Liss and thank you for watching. You can join the program again anytime visit our website aljazeera.com for further discussion. Go to our Facebook page facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. For me, Rochelle Carey and the entire team here in Doha. Bye for now.